Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Nathan Millard? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing you by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the incident, then offer my analysis. In 2023, 42-year-old Nathan Millard lived in Covington, Georgia, which is about 40 minutes east of Atlanta. He owned a construction business located in nearby Conyers, Georgia. Nathan was on his second marriage. He had two children from his first marriage and one from his second. In the past, Nathan had difficulty regulating his intake of alcohol. He had been to a substance use treatment facility in 2021. Nathan became particularly gullible when he consumed alcohol. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On February 22, 2023, Nathan flew from Atlanta, Georgia to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. This was supposed to be a business trip. He wanted to investigate a possible job site for his construction company. Nathan was only planning on being in Baton Rouge for 24 hours. At 7.30 p.m., Nathan communicated with his wife via FaceTime he was at a college basketball game. At 9.30 p.m., he had dinner with a client at Happy's Irish Pub on 3rd Street in downtown Baton Rouge. At 11.17 p.m., Nathan was seen leaving the pub. His drinking behavior ceased after an employee identified him as too intoxicated. One report indicated that he wasn't served any alcohol while he was at the pub this time. Nathan had also been to that same pub earlier that night and to another place that served alcohol, so he had many opportunities to drink alcohol. Nathan told his client that he was going back to his hotel room at the Courtyard Hotel, which was a block away from the pub. Nathan never returned to his hotel room. Instead, he met with a homeless man who the police referred to using the initials JW. This man helped Nathan to get to a Greyhound bus station on Florida Street, they arrived there at about 11.30 p.m. This is less than a mile from the pub. Nathan used his ATM card to withdraw cash. An employee at the bus station took notice of Nathan and offered him assistance. Nathan said that he lost his cell phone. The employee offered to take him back to his hotel or call a rideshare vehicle, but Nathan refused. He told the employee he was, quote, looking for something to make him feel better, unquote, Nathan also said that he was, quote, looking for a girl to take back to his room, unquote. J.W. introduced Nathan to a black male and a black female. The police referred to the black male as C and the black female as L.M. Reportedly, L.M. was a sex worker. Nathan started walking in the area with his newfound friends. At some point during the early morning hours, now on February 23, they introduced him to a 45-year-old known drug dealer named Derek Perkins. Between 4.17 a.m. and 4.24 a.m., Nathan was captured on video surveillance. He was at a Circle K gas station on Nicholson Drive. This was the last time Nathan Millard would be seen alive. At 9 a.m., a client who Nathan was supposed to meet that morning called the police after Nathan missed a meeting. Later, Nathan's phone and wallet were found a few blocks from his hotel. At 11 a.m., Derek Perkins was captured on video surveillance using Nathan's ATM car on Highland Road. A sex worker named Tabitha Lee Barner was with Derek in a blue Toyota Camry. A witness later told the police that he rented a blue 2004 Toyota Camry and let Derek use it, but Derek never returned it to him. It seems likely that this is the Toyota Derek was seen driving. The police started searching for Nathan, but they did not have any success. There were grave concerns that something terrible happened to him. On March 6, at 3.34 a.m., Nathan's body was found after a witness reported an unpleasant odor coming from behind a defunct funeral home on Scenic Highway. On March 13, a blue Toyota Camry was found on fire about one block east of where Nathan's body was found. Derek Perkins was arrested that same day and charged with criminal damage to property, obstruction of justice, failure to seek assistance, and unlawful 
disposal of remains. Derek agreed to be interviewed by the police about what happened to Nathan Millard. Here is the story that Derek supplied to the police. During the early morning hours of February 23, 2023, Derek encountered Nathan on Convention Street. Derek was introduced to Nathan by the two people who the police referred to as LM and C. All four of them drove around for a while in a blue Toyota Camry and used cocaine. They stopped at a Circle K gas station on Nicholson Drive. Nathan was supposed to get money from the ATM there, but he returned to the Camry and told Derek that he was worried that LM and C were going to rob him. Due to these concerns, Nathan and Derek abandoned their two companions and drove away from the gas station. Nathan informed Derek that he wanted a, quote, white girl, unquote, and he wanted to go somewhere safe. Derek noticed a white sex worker named Tiffany Ann Goodry walking in the area. He picked up Tiffany for Nathan. After stopping in an ATM so Nathan could get more cash, Derek drove Nathan and Tiffany to a house on Lori Burgess Avenue. After arriving, Nathan told Derek he wanted more white girls. In order to satisfy Nathan's unwavering wish for white women, Derek drove to the residence of Tabitha Lee Barner, picked her up, and drove her back to the house. So now there were four people in this house, Derek, Nathan, Tiffany, and Tabitha. Derek said the other three started using drugs intravenously. He told the police, quote, they were all up in there doing that blank. I don't blank with that blank, unquote. Derek maintained that he only smoked crack cocaine and would cringe when other people would use drugs intravenously. He went outside and sat on the front porch. Derek left to purchase some items at a nearby store. He then went out to get more cocaine. When he returned from this trip, Derek claimed that Tabitha ran out of the house and said that Nathan was dead. Tabitha tried administering Narcan, but it didn't help. Derek panicked as Tabitha ran out of the house. He and Tiffany rolled up Nathan's body in a carpet and placed it in the trunk of the Toyota Camry. After driving around with the body for a while, they eventually disposed of it at the old funeral home where it was eventually found. Derek claimed that he sold the Camry to some unknown men they must have been the ones who set the vehicle on fire. Again, it's important to note that this was Derek's version of events. Tabitha told the police that she never met Nathan. Derek showed up at her home looking for Narcan. She tried to go with him, but Tiffany was in the front seat and the back seat was too cluttered. She admitted that she was with Nathan later that day because she was trying to get drugs, but claimed that she never went into the house on Lori Burgess Avenue. Not surprisingly, 33-year-old Tabitha and 27-year-old Tiffany are now facing charges, including failure to seek assistance. On March 28, the coroner released the autopsy and toxicology report for Nathan. His death was ruled an accident. Nathan had cocaine, ethanol, and fentanyl in his system when he died. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Nathan had previously been addicted to drugs. Given the enthusiasm that he exhibited in his effort to secure drugs and companionship in Baton Rouge, it appears as though he abandoned his sobriety, like he was cutting loose. He wanted to go wild. It's possible that his alcohol consumption created a slippery slope type of situation, like when he became a little disinhibited, this led to more drinking, which eventually led to cocaine use, and finally, to even more dangerous substance use behavior. Item number two, the account that Derek Perkins gave to the police may contain a few inaccuracies. It's not clear if Tabitha and Tiffany were actually involved with Nathan at all. It appears as though the primary evidence against them came in the form of Derek's statement. Characterizing his credibility as abysmal would be overly generous to him. There are a few things that Derek said to the police that are very difficult to believe. For example, he claimed that Nathan gave him permission to use his ATM card, and he claimed that he sold the Toyota Camry. So Derek would have people believe that whoever bought the Camry decided to set it on fire not far from where Derek disposed of Nathan's body. That's an incredible and unbelievable coincidence. Item number three, if Nathan was responsible for his own death, like if this was an accident, then Derek took a tremendous chance by using Nathan's ATM card and disposing of his body. Derek was risking being accused 
of murder. It makes it seem as though Derek was an uncaring individual who only wanted to escape responsibility. He had absolutely no regard for Nathan's safety or well-being. To be fair, drug dealers are not typically known for maintaining an exemplary track record for safety and compassion. This brings me to item number four. Nathan took a tremendous risk in Baton Rouge. He seemed to be walking around the city with absolutely zero regard for his own safety. He was interacting with people that he didn't know and asking to engage in criminal activity. One curious element of Nathan's behavior is how he informed Derek about his robbery fears. This is when they abandoned their companions at the gas station. So Nathan was looking for a known drug dealer to protect him from getting robbed. The house that Derek took Nathan to was not in a good neighborhood. A number of the houses in the area had bars on the windows and not just for aesthetic value. Now moving to my final thoughts. For some reason, Nathan Millard decided to start drinking when he was in Baton Rouge. He knew that he shouldn't. He was aware that he had a problem. But at this point, it did not matter to him. He quickly became intoxicated and out of control. He stumbled in the bushes, walked into traffic, and eventually found other ways to get in trouble. He associated with people who viewed him as a potential source of revenue and did not seem to care if he lived or died. After his overdose, his new associates did not call for help. Rather, they allegedly disposed of his body. The outcome from Nathan's behavior can serve as a lesson to those who think that alcohol is not dangerous. Furthermore, it's a reminder for those with a substance use history that it can be very easy to have a relapse which is worse than any other drinking episode in their history. Those are my thoughts in the case of Nathan Millard. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.